Good afternoon. It is truly an honor to introduce today's guest. Preparing students to lead has been a cornerstone of this university since our founding over three centuries ago. As John Quincy Adams once said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. And surely this definition suits our distinguished visitor. Her Majesty Queen Rania al-Abdullah has led by example from the moment that she entered public life. With varied interests and boundless energy, Her Majesty is actively involved in worthy causes that affect the lives of citizens in Jordan and people all over the world. Her Majesty's interest in family welfare, particularly education, occupies much of her time. Her Majesty is chair of the Jordan Education Society, which is dedicated to improving and modernizing Jordan's education system. She's also patron of the Madrasati School, Madrasati Program, roughly translated my school, which helps refurbish disadvantaged public schools throughout Jordan. Her Majesty's impact on the world stage has been equally impressive. She is an acknowledged humanitarian and advocate for the less fortunate. In July, Her Majesty became the honorary chair of the United Nations Girls Education Initiative. She's been a long-standing patron of UNICEF for over a decade. Queen Rania has been a passionate voice for cross-cultural dialogue and the need for peace. She is focused on providing spaces for the world's youth to come together in a spirit of peace and respect to discuss differences and the challenges of our times. Her Majesty's desire to reach young people has made her one of the most accessible of world leaders today. In March 2008, Queen Rania launched her own channel on YouTube dedicated to creating better understanding of Islam and the Muslim world. In November 2008, over three million, by November 2008, over three million people had visited this channel. And this year, Her Majesty began the revolutionary work of using Twitter. Over 700,000 people from every corner of the globe have responded to her tweets. <coughs> Her Majesty has also been a proud patron of the arts. Of particular notes, she helped in 2002 sponsor and inaugurate an exhibition of magnificent works of female artists entitled Breaking the Veils, Women Artists from the Islamic World. This exhibition has traveled throughout the Muslim world and has toured in Europe and the United States and I am very proud to say is currently on exhibit right here at Yale at the Institute for Sacred Music. The Breaking the Veils exhibit is but one of the many activities and programs that take place here on the Yale campus with a focus on the contemporary Middle East. In recent years, we've vigorously increased our campus uh, activities and course offerings in this field. We now have a modern Middle Eastern studies major. We have eight new faculty members teaching courses related to the contemporary Middle East. Each year, we bring distinguished scholars from the region to enhance further the discourse on our campus. And, as demonstrated by the wonderful Ramadan banquet that took place last week in the Yale Commons, Yale is a place where Muslim students and scholars are welcomed and embraced with respect. Yale students, faculty, and alumni have also been active in Jordan as well as throughout the region. Of particular note, students and faculty from the School of Architecture here are involved in the creation of a proposed peace park which will be built on the banks of the Jordan River. Beginning in 2010, Yale College students will be able to study Arabic at a, Yale study, at a Yale summer study program in Jordan. And we hope that the number of students and scholars from Jordan will grow in the future. Uh, we're very proud of the small but excellent number who are here right now. To symbolize our commitment to building strong relationships in the Middle East, I'm very pleased to announce today the creation of a Queen Rania Fellowship for the study of the contemporary Middle East. It's my sincere hope that students who become Queen Rania Fellows in the near future will not only learn about the region while they're here, but will also contribute to scholarship on this significant part of the world. In every generation, there are leaders who stand a little taller than those around them, whose light shines a little brighter than their contemporaries. Today, we're honored to host such a figure. And with that, let me introduce our guest, Her Majesty Queen Rania al-Abdullah, Queen of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan.
President Levin, Dean Lorimer, faculty, students, thank you so much for making me feel so welcome here at Yale. I've wanted to come here for many years, and I'm so grateful to everyone for the hospitality and kindness you've shown to me and my staff. I've really been looking forward to seeing the Yale landmarks that I've heard about for so long now. The Beinecke Library, Harkness Tower, Old Campus, Peter Salome's mustache. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't make it quite in time for that last one. <laughs> but everything else is even more impressive than I'd imagined. This is a spectacular place. Indeed, I have to admit, as I was preparing for this visit, I wondered what on earth I could tell you that you didn't already know. Yaleys have won 17 Nobel Prizes, six presidential elections, and even two Heisman trophies. You can choose from more than 2,000 courses, Browse more than 12 million books in the libraries, make friends from more than 110 countries, and as far as I can tell from the posters all around campus, try it for 3,000 a cappella singing groups. <laughs> yeah. So, rather than try to compete with all of that, I thought I'd speak from my own experience. I thought I'd offer an Arab perspective on my part of the world and our hopes for peace and progress, especially with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I'm guessing since you made the time to be here today when you could have been doing something really important, like researching a paper or visiting a professor or calling your mom to tell her just how much you love her, <laughs> that this is an audience that already cares about international relations. But I do realize that foreign policy isn't typically a top concern for the American public, and especially not in the time of economic hardship at home. A poll earlier this year found that 75% of Americans agreed terrorism should be one of President Obama's top priorities, but almost no other foreign policy issues made it to the top 20 list. So I don't expect that the Arab-Israeli conflict is foremost on most people's minds. Yet, in many ways, that conflict is at the core of U.S.-Arab relations, or at least at the core of Arab public opinion of America. When Arabs were asked in a poll this spring what two steps by the U.S. would improve their views of the United States the most, more than 40% said a peace agreement between Israel and Palestine. The same poll found that 99% of people put the conflict in their top five priorities, and one in three say the Palestinian issue is their number one concern. That's because, for us, the occupation is a hurt we feel each day. In Jordan, nearly a third of our population are Palestinian refugees. Look at the people sitting on either side of you. Imagine one was, was a refugee, forced to seek haven in your country because her family had been driven from their own. In Jordan, we have to be concerned with the conflict because we are living with its consequences. We don't have the luxury of shifting our focus away. We know as well that the crisis in Palestine does not exist in a vacuum. What happens in Palestine is related to what happens in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria. The longer the conflict in Palestine persists, the weaker the moderate majority becomes, the more extremists gain leverage they can exploit, and the greater the risk of instability throughout our region. So, we appreciated President Obama's outreach in his Cairo speech. We appreciated his acknowledgement that the conflict remains a major source of tension between us and his pledge to pursue a two-state solution with patience and dedication. We appreciated the appointment of Senator George Mitchell as a special envoy. But we are impatient. When it comes to Palestine, time has not been a friend. To the contrary, sometimes Palestine seems like the land that time forgot. You know, when I started college back in 1988, Europe was divided. The United States had an existential foe called the USSR. Much of Latin America was ruled by juntas, South Africa by apartheid. Civil conflicts had been raging for decades, from Guatemala to Northern Ireland. Nelson Mandela lived in a cell, and Palestine was occupied. 
These were the problems we used to describe as intractable, even insoluble. Yet, hatreds have given way to handshakes. Prisoners have become presidents, but not in Palestine. In Palestine, walls are going up, not coming down, 400 kilometers to be precise. The decades have brought what feels like an endless parade of starts and stalemates, missed opportunities, shattered hopes, and diminishing returns. And I'm not here to talk about blame. That doesn't get us anywhere. It's like tracing your finger on a Mobius strip, going round in an infinite loop. But coming from Jordan, I feel I must speak for those voices that Americans rarely hear to describe the sense of identity theft that Palestinians have endured for over 60 years. Because their pain is, more, is about more than just the loss of their land, their olive trees, their livelihoods. Their grief is, more, is about more than just being kicked out of their homes in which their families have lived for generations. As one scholar put it, land is the geography of the Palestinian soul. Their very understanding of who they are is deeply rooted in the context of their environment. So each new claim on their ever-shrinking space feels like a blow to their very existence. Having no place to call their own is like having no identity at all. Think about it. When you enroll here at Yale, one of the first things you receive is an ID. It allows you access to residential colleges, dining halls, the library stacks. It opens doors. It gets you in. It shows that you belong. And when you leave Yale, you get a piece of paper to carry with you, a diploma that gives you status before you ever have to say a word. In the West Bank and Gaza, young people like you are given an ID as well. But this ID is not about access. It's only about limitation. It limits the boundaries of where they can go, what they can do, who they can be. It's a constant reminder that in others' eyes, they are less valuable, less important, simply less. UN sources report that almost 40% of the West Bank is now covered by settlement-related Israeli infrastructure. Barriers, buffer zones, military bases, barbed wire, and barricades. Parents can't get to work. Students can't get to class. Sick people can't get to hospitals. All traffic is stopped, from people on foot to cars and trucks to ambulances. The wait can be hours, often only to find that passage is refused, relatives detained on their way to a family wedding, Children searched, their notes ripped from their school books. Grandparents forced to stand for hours holding packages and heavy bags. The unpredictability, anxiety, and humiliation are as wearing as the delay. And so much more than freedom of movement is lost when each day is defined by these checkpoints, with armed soldiers demanding Hawiya, ID. Hawiya, ID. Show me proof that you exist. The degradation is compounded by the sense that no one cares, that the outside world, world is oblivious to the hardships Palestinians endure, especially in Gaza, where for two years, families have faced the collective punishment of blockade. And for three months at the start of this year, they were subjected to devastating attack with no place to run and nowhere to hide, not even UN hospitals or schools. Today, a million people, almost 70% of Gaza's population, are refugees. Homes lie in rubble. Hospitals lack power. Sewage pipes threaten to burst. The economy has totally, utterly collapsed. Unemployment is approaching 50%. One resident calls it a jail where no prisoner knows the length of his sentence. And not one penny of the billions of dollars pledged for reconstruction has gotten through. More than half the population of Gaza is under the age of 18. Children did not create this conflict, but they are its greatest victims. Just listen to the words of the four small children who were found by the Red Cross in January in the shell-battered neighborhood of Zaytun, clinging to their mother's corpses. They couldn't speak. They were too weak to stand. They hadn't eaten for days, while the firefight raged outside the door and their families died inside. They survived, and they're alive, but that's not the same as surviving. These children had nothing but their mother's love, and now they have lost that too. And the worst threat of all is the cynicism so many people feel, the sense that Middle East peace is hopeless, that we'll never find a solution. Because if we throw up our hands and say, this problem is too hard, 
we're not just writing off a process or writing off a roadmap. We're writing off people's lives. But let me be clear. It isn't just the Palestinians' lives that are at stake here. Israelis, too, need a future of peace and security. They, too, need to be free of wailing sirens announcing an attack. And they, too, need to grow up to grow, to grow up without the shadow of walls and watchtowers. For as a columnist from a leading Israeli daily wrote this spring, one of the casualties of occupation may be a healthy state of Israel itself. So what must be done? On the political front, we need courage, accountability, and action. And we see signs of hope as President Obama and his team invest their time and capital in breathing life into negotiations for two viable, secure, sovereign states. We see signs of hope as all 22 members of the Arab League have offered Israel full recognition in exchange for withdrawal to its pre-1967 border. We see signs of hope as brave people on both sides say they are ready to give peace a chance, 64% of Palestinians and 40% of Israelis who support the Arab League plan. Now all sides must take responsibility for building on this momentum. And let me say clearly, the responsibility includes the Arab world. We decry the actions of Israeli extremists, but must work harder to rein in our own. We look to the West to do more in support of Palestinian needs, but must do our part and must press the Palestinians toward unity among themselves. At the same time, as my husband, His Majesty King Abdullah has said, it is time for Israel to choose, to integrate into the region accepted and accepting with normal relations with its neighbors, or to remain fortress Israel, isolated and holding itself and the entire region a hostage to continuing confrontation. And from America too, we need sustained commitment, creative engagement, and leadership to keep the parties on the path to peaceful coexistence. But we need even more, because true peace depends not just on new lines on a map, it is not just the walls on the land that must go. We have to take down the walls in our hearts. There has been so much pain, so much loss, so much fear, so much hatred and mistrust. True peace depends on reconnecting the bonds of our common humanity. I was moved by something J.K. Rowling said in her commencement at Harvard last year. She said that humans have the unique ability to think themselves into other people's places to learn and understand new things they haven't actually experienced. And yet many choose to remain comfortably within the bounds of their own experience, never troubling to wonder how it would feel to have been born other than they are. They can refuse to hear screams or to peer inside cages. They can close their minds and hearts to any suffering that doesn't touch them personally. They can refuse to know. Rowling went on to say, I might be tempted to envy people who can live that way, except that I do not think that they have any fewer nightmares than I do. I think the willfully unimaginative see more monsters, she said. They are more afraid. She is right. So often we dread what we do not know. We live in fear of the things we cannot see, but we'll never move forward by closing ourselves off. The only way to grow is to reach out. To truly make peace in the Middle East or anywhere in the world, we all have to th learn to think ourselves into other people's places, to put ourselves in other people's shoes, to make room for other pe people's hopes and fears. For the more we appreciate one another's perspective, the more dimension and depth we add to our own. And in many respects, that's what a liberal education is all about. It's about asking questions without prejudicing the answers, drawing lessons from other people's experiences, testing and refining our own values and beliefs, developing the habits of an open mind. When we shine the light of inquiry, broad-mindedness and compassion, that is how we find our way to our own best selves. The more open we become, the more we find we can contain. It's the lux that leads the way to the veritas. And when it comes to the Middle East, no matter how great the fears, no matter how deep the mistrust, if we shine that light, we are sure to reveal what has always and will always be true. There is no difference between the love the Palestinians and Israelis feel for their children. No difference between their laughter or their tears. 
we share one humanity. As one of my heroes, Desmond Tutu, likes to say, we, all of us, have been made for goodness. We have been made for laughter. We have been made for caring, for sharing, for compassion. For we do indeed inhabit a moral universe. And yes, goodness is powerful. Yale, as global citizens, we have a responsibility to one another. In our interconnected world, there are no zero-sum games. We win or lose together. We all have a stake in peace and justice, for all of us are diminished by their absence. Let us work together in the Middle East and around the world to make peace come true for good. Thank you all very much. I want to thank uh, the audience for submitting so many possible questions here I'm trying to sift through. But I will uh, take the privilege of the chair and start with uh, one or two of my own, inspired by your remarks. Um, I, I, um, I think, I, I think the, the reaction of the audience um, suggests that we, uh, virtually everyone here, finds your appeal to open-mindedness and to hope for a, uh, a solution in the Middle East, uh, particularly with respect to Israel and Palestine, to be something inspiring and, and, uh, and motivating for us all. I, I, I think uh, one question to ask is what role can the United States play? You spoke of President Obama charting a new direction. Are there ways that President Obama and the United States can, be, can give an assist to this process, and in particular, what kinds of actions might be called for on our part? Absolutely. I really do believe that the, the two sides cannot uh, do it on their own. And the United States plays an instrumental role uh, in, in getting the two sides around the negotiating table. The United States has the role to play in terms of um, remaining, uh, offering leadership, remaining engaged, being committed to the process. We need the United States to be a, um, to be like, to, to show the leadership in, in the process, to, to, to lead the way. Uh, to enforce, uh, to be a referee, to give guardianship. Um, there are so many sticking issues out there, and you know, settlement is the settlement is one of the issues that that have been an obstacle most recently. And we need someone to be a fair broker between the the two sides. And it comes with the realization that uh, peace is not just of strategic interest to the Palestinians and Israelis themselves, but for the entire world, and for the United States as well. Uh, there is peace is the one thing that's going to undermine the extremists in the region and undermine the radical ideology that has emerged in recent years. So we all have a vested interest in making sure that this uh, conflict is resolved once and for all. And unfortunately, you know, we've had so much process. We've had so many, uh, you know, we don't need political leaders, politicians dealing with papers. We need politicians dealing with people. We don't need process. We need projects on the ground because the, the you know, incremental steps that have been taken have really frustrated uh, people. Uh, they've made people um, lose hope in the process, and they just feed the agendas of those who are, who are opposed to peace. So we need concise uh, and, and concrete and tangible steps on the ground that can really improve the lives of the people uh, in, in Palestine and Israel. Clearly, that's the central issue for, uh, for the Obama administration to deal with in the Middle East. Are there others, are there other things that the Arab world would look to this country to do over the, over the years ahead in terms of strengthening you know, our if, contribution? If there's, if, if there's one thing that, um, that undermines U.S. credibility in our region, it is that issue. Mm -hmm. Because it is, you know, I think the world looks, judges the United States when Israel uh, breaks international law or when they don't honor their commitments, for example, uh, with the building of the separation wall, with the expansion of the settlements, uh, with uh, changes on the ground that have changed the multi-faith character of Jerusalem. 
people feel that Israel will not have been able to do that if the United States did not condone this. So the one thing that could really build up the credibility and show goodwill is if we reach a fair and just solution to this uh, issue. Of course, uh, outreach to the Arab world um, is, is very important, and President Obama's um, uh, approach and his diplomacy uh, with our region and his uh, vision for a relationship that's based on mutual trust and mutual interests has really been welcomed in, in the Arab world. Of course, you know, you have the issues in, in, in Iraq, um, uh, and, and you know, there's obviously the issue in Iran and all of those areas, but I think it's a matter of engaging the Arab world, uh, listening uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, sure. and having a real measured and studied approach uh, when you deal with, with our region. That's great. Um, let me take one question from the audience. That, um, you've been a very vocal proponent of the UN Millennium Goals. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we all have concerns, and there just was a report last week uh, about how the slowdown in the, in the worldwide economy has affected uh, mm -hmm. prospects for realizing those goals. Um, you know, that hunger and, and um, mm -hmm. uh, some areas is actually worsening, not getting better. What, what, what's your prognosis? How, do you see the, any prospect of reaching the, those goals by 2015? So, so in, t in the year 2000, uh, world leaders came together and they came up with eight promises that they made for this world, you know, ending hunger, um, getting children into school, uh, uh, reducing uh, child mortality, uh, dealing with environmental issues, eight promises. And we're supposed to reach them by the year 2015. And, you know, that was, those promises were a mandate to change the story of human history. And, you know, it's been said that promises are a uniquely human way of ordering the future. So back then, uh, world leaders had the compassion, the commitment to make those promises. Now we're two-thirds of the way there, and as you mentioned, I think we're far from reaching many of those goals. The one that I've been focusing on the most is education. And today we have about 75 million children out of school. To get them into school, will require $11 billion uh, a year, which might, might sound like a lot, but it is less than what the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq cost in one month. Um, so it, it, when you think about it, it's actually the bargain of, of, of the century. It's the best investment we can make. Um, what's required is for us to create the critical mass of supporters for these, for these goals so that, the, so that the leaders feel the pressure to uh, fulfill their commitments and fulfill the pledges that they made for those uh, children in the developing world. I think, you know, we all owe it to, to the mothers and fathers who want to give their children education, just like, you know, we all cared, your parents cared about sending you here because they understand how critical it is for the way that your life is going to look for you to get a quality education. So uh, what we really require is more awareness and a rallying of the public behind some of these goals. No. Um, education, of course, has been a major uh, emphasis of your own in, in, um, in Jordan, and you know, we look at it, of course, from a bit of a parochial perspective. We would like to see more Middle Eastern students come to this country, and I think, as we know, we were talking just before this uh, session mm -hmm. about the dropping off of applicants to the United States from the Middle East right after 9-11 in the first few years. Um, uh, re recently, the numbers have started to turn back up. Overall, international applications have were actually up 7% last year. Um, but there's still reluctance in the Middle East to come to the United States. Um, wh what can places like Yale do to help convince, um, you know, your constituencies and, your, uh, and, and others in uh, the Middle East that this is a welcoming and a, and a friendly place and that we actually want uh, Middle Eastern students. Are, well, there, are there strategies you would recommend for us? Well, let me, let me start by saying that the United States status in the world does, was not born out of its size or military might or politics around the world. It was, it comes from the principles and values upon which this country was found. Because the United States is more than a country, it is a concept. It is a concept of openness, diversity, tolerance, acceptance, meritocracy, innovation, philanthropy, all of these are the values that make the United States what, is it, what it is in the world. That was a and, pretty good advertisement for the United States. And, well, <laughs> uh, let me finish my answer. <laughs> We're not there yet. So, so 
to keep that status, I think the United States will be well advised to preserve those values. Absolutely. And not having, uh, ha being able to open your doors to the best and brightest from all over the world is extremely instrumental to be able to Absolutely. maintain uh, these values. And you know, I see all over the world other countries who are, you know, building great universities, trying to attract students. I would hate to see the United States slide in that regard. Mm -hmm. So it's so important for you to maintain that diversity, to maintain that openness, to really attract people from all over the world. It's only, uh, it would be a loss to the states if you, you didn't. And one way to do that is to reassure uh, those young people that they will be treated fairly if they come to this country, that they, they don't want to be discriminated against, they don't want to be singled out. Right. And unfortunately, some stereotypes have been quite pervasive and that has scared a lot of people from my part of the world uh, from coming to the United States, and so they've chosen to go to Europe or, or Canada or any other country. So you know, I hope that this trend is reversed, uh, and a little bit of um, uh, openness and acceptance, I think, will go a long way. I, I think that's, yeah, I certainly agree. Actually, there's a, there's a question from one of the students in the audience um, that relates to this question of stereotyping, uh, um, which you might want to tackle, which is, and I, I, well, I'll read this one exactly, there's discussion among Arabs, he, Arab students here in the United States about who has more of a responsibility to break down stereotypes, Arabs or non-Arabs, because both have stereotypes of each other. And it's, there's not always agreement. So what do you think of this line of argument? Does one group have more of a responsibility than the other, or is this oh, something I, both absolutely. groups Absolutely, and I have no doubt in my mind that both groups have an equal amount of effort to do. This is about a dialogue, it involves two people, and it has to go both ways. Right. We are just as guilty of stereotypes towards the West as the West is of stereotypes towards us. And uh, you know, there, is, there has been a, a gulf that has emerged in recent years, particularly after 9-11, and it's incumbent about all of, on all of us moderates to, to try to break that. You know, the one thing I find is that uh, extremists and those with a radical ideology, they are willing to act on their beliefs, but the moderates are, are not as willing. You know, mm -hmm. they, they may show apathy. Uh, we can sometimes be lazy. But what's the point of having beliefs if we don't act on them? You know, if we are for openness and, and diversity and, and equal rights and freedoms, what's the point of having uh, that, that those beliefs without, without really doing something about it. And that's where the, that's where the radicals and extremists uh, have won up on us because, for example, you know, we find that in countries uh, around the world, um, education is a battleground with youth are being on the front lines. And the extremists try to get in there and fill their minds with content. You know, with extreme ideologies, with, uh, with hatred towards the rest of the world, with uh, preaching violence. But what are we doing? We're not even going there. Yeah. So, you know, we need, to, we need to go into the areas that we have left vacant, and that is primarily our youth's minds, and try to get them in the right direction. And you all have a very important role to do. Will you get them to believe in the values you articulated? about what America stands for, and we will try to get President Obama to get a solution in yeah, Palestine. You have a deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know that another passion of yours is our, our women's issues and the rights and, uh, of women and indeed the opportunities for women. And actually there are a, a number of questions from the audience. I'll try mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. just pick one about that issue. Uh, and this, I think this is an interesting one. Could you give us some specific ways in that, by which women's empowerment could be achieved in an Islamic cultural context? Are there, are there special avenues or particular things that could be done to? Well, well one thing one thing I find uh, I've found over the years a little bit frustrating is that when people look at women in Muslim countries, they tend to you know look at our region as a one monolithic whole. When the reality is that diff different women in different countries are in different circumstances and have achieved different levels of progress. So there's no single mold for an Arab woman, just like there's no single mold for an American woman. You know, uh, the, the status of women in the, in the Arab world, the Muslim world, depends on her upbringing, her family, her education, etc. So that's one thing that we have right. to sort of exactly. clear. And, another you know, stereotype to a, another stereotype. To break and we down. find that in many countries in the, in the Arab world, women are making incredible uh, progress. Mm -hmm. Some countries they face many challenges. Um, we, some, we definitely have to work on some of the legal uh, aspects and legal rights for women. Um, we have to work on the education to break down some of the stereotypes that are in our curricula. 
Um, most importantly, we have to get more women in the workplace because we find that although we've attained high levels of education for women, not many women are going into, in, into the workplace. Mm -hmm. So there are many uh, challenges that we have to overcome. But the one thing that I always sort of encounter, it's, it's the mindsets, you know, it's, it's age-old perceptions. It's societal habits that just need to be uh, changed and, and refined. Those are the things, that, those are the obstacles that hold women back. And more and more, we really have to focus on, on changing those. Mm -hmm. uh, one student asks, how has Jordan been affected by the global financial crisis? Has this, has this man caused you difficulties sort of with your own agenda in, in the, in the Absolutely. country? Absolutely. I don't think any country has not been affected by the crisis. Now, we have some countries in our region that are doing quite well especially some of the Gulf countries, the oil-rich countries. Fortunately, Jordan is not one of those. But um, uh, we found that you know, some of the invest foreign direct investment into Jordan has been uh, reduced. Uh, um, you know, a lot of the Jordanians that used to work abroad, some of them have lost their jobs. So uh, remittances, the remittances have gone down a little. You know, we're affected by the tourism maybe being weakened. So, we, you know, we have been uh, affected to some extent, but you know, we're still moving forward. We're still working on our reforms, uh, economic reforms, and 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 uh, political reforms. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it slowed us down a little bit, but we're hopefully uh, moving forward still. Yeah. You know, the political issue of the moment here in the United States is health care reform. Yes. Um, right. Hard to miss that. What? Yeah. One, so, one stu one. Uh, 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 a student here who is, uh, I guess, studying for both an MD and an MBA, is asking, "What do you, um, what do you think of the, what you know, what are two quest, two part question? What are the healthcare challenges today in your country?" Mm -hmm. And this one, I doubt you'll answer. The second one, what, what, uh, what do you think should be done in the United States? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. Take I wish the first I one first. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you know we have the challenge of providing uh, health insurance for our population uh, and trying to cover as many people as possible. Right. So obviously, it's, it's it's focusing on the the regulations, the, uh, the the policies that the the quality control. We have a lot of people. We actually have um, some of the best doctors in the region, and a mm -hmm. lot of people come to Jordan for for treatment. So. With that, you want to make sure that this doesn't become a commercialized sector and that you maintain the quality and integrity of, uh, of the profession. So, um, but yes, we do face challenges because of our economic financial challenges. Jordan is not a rich country, and so we're not able to necessarily give everybody the uh, quality of health care that, that we'd like. As to what should be done in this country, <laughs> that is a very complicated uh, debate. and. Uh, uh, the one thing that I will say is that President Obama, um, I don't know if his plan is the right one or not, but he is going about it in a very studied kind of way. I know that he's reached out to many people in the sector, try to get as much impu input as possible, try to process this information as well as he can. There is no perfect plan for the United States. Uh, eventually, they're going to have to make a choice and make, that that, make sure that that choice works. But staying in a state of limbo, I think, is not really benefiting anyone in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, when you talked about women, I was, you, you talk about the importance of increasing labor force participation. Are there specific measures you're taking in Jordan to try to make that happen, or anything creative being done in the region to actually help women enter the labor force? I mean, pres presumably your own example of being a woman in a leadership position and being so visible and so out front on so many social issues probably is an inspiration. But are there concrete policies that have helped that help to look in the in the in the Arab world? In? One of the major challenges that we face is creating enough jobs. Uh, so the challenges for women and for our youth. Now, uh, for us to pre just to prevent a rise in unemployment, we have to create 3.5 million jobs a year, and that's a lot. And we're having a problem of supply and demand. On the other side, the quality of the education generally provided is not what it should be. A lot of our educational systems are a little bit outdated. They focus on uh, rote learning and memorization as, as opposed to critical thinking, problem solving, creative, creativity. So we need to update the way we teach and make sure that our young people are better prepared to enter the workplace, whether they're girls or boys. So, um, so on the one end, we're trying to work on fixing the educational system and then also to try to smooth out the transition from school to work. 
you know, by offering vocational training, by getting some of the private sector people involved in the process so they provide internship training. They let us know what their demands are from the young people so that we graduate the kind of people that they uh, want to hire. But it's, it's, it's a complicated oh, thing. Yeah. When it comes to women, again, it's, it's through example. We have so many women now. If you think 20 years ago in the Arab world, there were only a handful of women in government. Now almost every country has female ministers. We have women CEOs, we have women in the judiciary system, so they're, they're there. We're making tremendous progress, but we're nowhere near where we should be. Uh, but the trend is, is positive and, and moving forward, and I think that's, that's what matters, and perceptions are changing very quickly. But, you know, editing attitudes takes a while, you know? Right. So there are actually a whole host of questions from the audience about you, about you as a person. So most appropriate to following that answer would be, would be perhaps this one. How do you balance, you know, we talk about work and life balance, uh, family, right. family and, work, and workplace balance. How do you balance your responsibilities as a mother and a family member on the one hand and, and queen? And you know, I've, been, I've been asked this question so many times, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and every time I say I'm going to get the answer, but I never do because there really isn't one, you know, it, there isn't a set formula um, for getting it right all the time and it's just a matter of trying your best every time, prioritizing, you know. Uh, there are times when my children take precedence, there are times when a particular project takes. It, 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 there, there isn't one way of, of doing it, but it's, I've learned to be kinder to myself over the years and realize that I can't do everything uh, uh, well all the time, uh, that something's gotta give, and that's okay, you know. It's, it's all right if you don't get it 100%, you know. It's, as long as you do your best, you know, I, and that, that's what I try to do. I'm sure you so do. So I think adopting a relaxed approach about, about it is, is, is probably the best way to go. Well, yeah. Your Majesty, you've been an inspiration to all of us. Uh, I, I really, I think everyone appreciates the forthrightness of your responses to these questions, your, your open-mindedness, your oh, energy, you. and your compassion for humanity. It's fabulous to have you here. I'm going to close by asking you to deliver on this most admiring of all the questions we received. And Alex, you may claim this if you, uh, if you come to my office uh, sometime tomorrow. This, this, this question is, Your Majesty, would you please autograph this? Oh. <laughs>